Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. This week, we talk with Superintendent of Education Molly Spearman about teachers, vaccines, and getting more students in school. I also talk with Dr. Rick Scott of Prisma Health about the latest vaccination effort underway in the state. Now for the latest from this week. This week, we saw action continue in federal court, where on Wednesday, former SCANA CEO Kevin Marsh pled guilty for his role in the $10 billion VC Summer nuclear debacle. As part of his plea deal, he'll spend two years in prison, be fined $5 million, and cooperate with investigators. The guilty plea bookends South Carolina U.S. Attorney Peter McCoy's involvement in the debacle, which he investigated while in the State House and prosecuted as U.S. Attorney. McCoy, a Trump appointee, will resign next week. DHEC Chief Dr. Edward Simmer said this week that lives were saved by not putting teachers ahead of elderly South Carolinians in vaccine phase 1A effectively ending a legislative push by lawmakers to get some 70,000 educators and staff moved up. The Senate sent a contentious $550 million Port of Charleston infrastructure bond bill to the House this week, and the House approved a bill limiting the governor's emergency powers. Joining me now to discuss teachers, the vaccine, and getting more face-to-face -face instruction going on back in the schoolroom is State Superintendent of Education Molly Spearman. Superintendent, welcome back. Thank you, Gavin. Great to be with you. So let's start right off about talking about trying to get more teachers into the schoolroom, going back in there face to face five days a week. Uh, you, you've moved since you know the beginning of the school year till now, asking these school districts to go back more face to face. Tell me what led to this shift and what you're seeing right now in the school districts. Well, when we wrote our Accelerate Ed plan back in the summer, we really did it fairly blindly, not knowing what was going to happen. Uh, we used the advice of the CDC and DHEC on, on masks, on social distancing, disinfectants, all of those things. And the truth is it worked. <laughs> it worked better than we ever dreamed. And the research now, uh, we've been in school long enough that research has been done to validate that school is a safe environment and that we can be in operation even when the spread in the community is high. Uh, it sometimes causes some quarantines, and but very little transmission, hardly any at all from student to student or student to teacher, a little bit adult to adult if the mitigation tools aren't used. So we've proven it's it's we proved it safe, and so I feel very uh, comfortable insisting that districts open back up and offer face to face full five days a week for everyone, even without teachers being able to get the vaccine at this point. Yes, um, of course I'm pushing for teachers to get the vaccine. You know I've been very involved with that over the last few weeks. But again, the research, if we look at the data, it says you do not have to be vaccinated in order to reopen schools. However, having teachers vaccinated would help us in continuing operation. We've got two districts that I know of right now, Allendale, Edgeville, both were back in school face to face, but they've had an outbreak among the adults. Uh, and by the way, it was done because a few were not following the mitigation strategies. Uh, but they've had to close down and go virtual for a couple of weeks. So that getting the vaccine would stop most of that. And that's that's the reason I'm pushing so much for the vaccine for educators. And when we look across the state, can you give me a breakdown of what, where schools are right now? How many schools are doing face to face? How many are doing hybrid sure. and how many just virtual at this point? Sure. We have 1,267 schools. <laughs> mm -hmm. Five of those are virtual all the time, so I'm not going to include them in the numbers, but close to 700 of our schools are back five days a week, full face-to-face. -face. Another um, right at 500, uh, 50 or so are uh, in a hybrid mode, two to four days a week. And then as of this week, there were 21 schools that were virtual, all virtual. And those are the ones who you know need to need to get back if possible. I do defend and will support any school district that makes a decision because of staffing that they have to go virtual. I understand that and realize that that could be a part of all this. But I do I've asked all superintendents to please offer a face to face five day a week option for all of their families. And those numbers have ticked up since you had your press conference with the governor earlier this month, right? Yes, I think everyone's working very hard. In fact, I know that just in the next week or two, York County, Aiken County, two of our large districts 
will be going back five days a week. So those numbers will drop. When you look at it overall, Gavin, about 97, 98% of our teachers are back doing some type of face-to-face. Um, so, you know, there's a small group that uh, has been very vocal. And, uh, but again, the majority is they're back. And mm-hmm. when I speak with teachers, they are very happy to be back. They're sad when they have to go virtual. They feel safe in the environment. And I've told them to report to us at the department if there are issues with any type of protocols that we need to know about that I should get involved in. But even when students are back, I heard from one down in Charleston, a high school senior who, who mentioned that, you know, that's, yes, they're back in school multiple days a week. But when they get to the classroom, they're sitting down at their desk and they're logging onto their computer to watch a virtual class, essentially. It seems like it's a little bit of a mix. I mean, how do you, I guess being back yeah. is somewhat of a benefit as well, but well, then they're I still. Heard, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I may need to check into that. Mm-hmm. I, I've not heard that complaint. Uh, certainly, I, our belief is if you're back, your teachers are back there with you uh, instructing. Now, there are many students who take virtual classes. We offer virtual SC through the Department of Education. So, you know, that, that could be the situation there where a student might be taking a, a class that's offered in a franchise. They couldn't find a teacher. The Department of Education offers that. Or either they want to take an advanced placement course virtually that's not offered. So, yes, there are students back at school who still do virtual. But overall, overall, um, the instruction should be going on face-to-face. Mm-hmm. And then keeping with the teachers and the vaccine, we did see a big push uh, that started in the Senate earlier this month, trying to get teachers at first to jump the line of of folks already in phase 1A. Uh, That got changed a little bit, then it moved over to the the House, which they've still been discussing this in subcommittee. You were before the subcommittee the other day. Uh, I want to get your thoughts about where teachers should be and and how it can be done effectively at this point. Should they be in 1A or should they be prioritized in 1B? Uh, What are your feelings on this? You know, I stand by my request. Uh, I wrote Governor McMaster and Director DeHeck asking that we be moved to 1A. So I stand by that. Uh, It does not look like that's going to happen. So the next step then is for us to be ready. And we have been diligently working over the last two weeks. I can tell you that every district in the state now has a vaccine plan. They've been matched up with a, provi- with a provider. And they have a detailed plan as to how it will operate once we get the vaccine. So uh, it sounds as though 1A, the 65-year-olds, that hopefully in the next mid-March, late March for sure, that that will be completed and 1B will open up. I can tell you that schools are going to be ready to go, and I hope that we'll be the first in line there. Uh, there are about five or 600,000 people <laughs> in that 1B group, so that that makes us want to be ready and uh I, we'll have the schools are ready right now. If we were if we were to get the go ahead today, we'd be ready to go, and we'll continue to maintain that readiness. Mm-hmm. And, and speaking about that, uh, Superintendent, when we look at getting the green light, what does that look like specifically? I know you've talked about you know different district plans. Does that mean uh, some vaccine gets diverted to certain districts and then they're administered by nurses there, or do teachers have to go to a local provider? Uh, how does that work? A mixture, a mixture, depending on the size of the district and how the provider, they've worked it out. Um, ideally, I think it is helpful if the provider can come on site in the district. But you have to realize we have districts with over 5,000 employees and we have districts with 100 mm-hmm. employees. Uh, so it's it's a different plan. School nurses are being used in many of the operations. They have to take some training for that. That's not going on now. So that if they're going to be used uh, in some of the plans, the providers are asking that the teachers drive to their mass vaccination site, which is already up and running. So it does depend uh, on the area and the um, capacity of the provider and what they have in place. Mm -hmm. And have you spoken with the governor recently about where teachers might be falling? Is there any inclination that he might still put them at the end of phase 1A, or do you think that he might prioritize them in 1B, which, according to DHEC Director Dr. Edward Simmer, sounds like it's about two to three weeks away when we start looking into getting appointments for phase 1B, which would, yeah. you know, not really help, I guess, this whole effort to get teachers back in the classroom before the end of the school year? Uh, I, I think the governor has been pretty firm in his stance on that, that 65-year-olds will be completed, uh, and once that is done, teachers will be ready to go after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, again, 
Uh, probably not in time for the end of the school year, though, just the way timing is going to work. Well, out we hope. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think once once we get the go ahead, we can do this pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine take two doses. If the um, the third Johnson & Johnson vaccine becomes available, that might make things move a little <clears throat> quickly because mm -hmm. it's only one dose. So a lot of that remains to be seen. That's out of my control. Uh, I'm just going to have our folks ready to go and we'll take whichever vaccine they send us. And then superintendent switching gears a little bit, you know, the big push for this is because face to face instruction is the best instruction available, uh, especially for students to retain information. Uh, you've done some recent assessments throughout the past this current school year. Uh, can you tell us about what you're seeing when it comes to how students are retaining information and this learning loss situation that you guys are confronting? Sure. Uh, in South Carolina, we are very fortunate that when we did the budget back in the continuing resolution on the budget, uh, additional language was added to require all school districts in the state to give interim assessments, one when children returned in August and then again in December, which was a new time that they didn't normally do these form, we call them formative or interim assessments. So they'll be doing another one in the spring as well. The data had to be sent to the department, which is a new th rule. They pay The districts pay for this, so we don't normally get this data, but we have it. We've crunched the data. Uh, it showed that there was significant loss, particularly in math in fourth and fifth graders, a loss across the board, but in those areas, those were the highest levels. Uh, we have been watching now and tracking the growth of those students uh, with the December assessment. Some grade levels, kindergarten and fifth graders and ninth graders seem to have caught up. They are where they should have been post COVID. Other areas, there, there is growth that needs to be going on. The data that we had have is readily available to teachers. In fact, they get it the next, that day or the next day. They have already hired retired teachers, folks to work as interventionists with these students, and some really strong work is going on. They're using their federal CARES Act, ESSER, those additional funds that they've gotten through uh, Congress to do that work, and it will remain. Right now, the districts are writing their plans because they've gotten additional funding that the expectation is to use that funding for learning loss. So we are receiving the plans right now from districts as to how they're going to manage that extra uh, instruction, uh, whether it's during the day, after school, and we are approving those plans now. So you're, are you concerned at this point about where we are with learning loss or do you feel confident that with plans well, coming on that yes. we could we can no, make up? Yeah, I, I'm concerned, but I'm optimistic as well that uh, the instruction uh, is going very well. Um, but the real fact, and it shines so openly here, is the students need to be with the teacher. They need to be at school. And uh, unfortunately, some of our poorest students, some of our students living in poverty, are the very ones who are at home virtually. And that's why it's so important to get them back at school. But I have great confidence, and we're doing everything we can to supply additional resources, uh, additional math resources, additional reading resources for elementary through high school students. Uh, so that not all the work has to be done in school, but they can manage some remediation if they're at home virtually. Mm -hmm. And then superintendent, just one final question here with about a minute left. I want to talk about that additional funding that you just mentioned there. We're looking at what, about $846 million going to districts from that last, from that that's last COVID exactly, relief? That's exactly, that's it, exactly it, right. It's, it's about the same it, amount that we would get normally for a normal uh, federal budget. Mm -hmm. So uh, extraordinary support. Now that money is spent over three years. It's not just for one year. So I do believe right now districts have ample funding to support what they need to do. Mm -hmm. And it, it can be pretty broad too from what I was reading. It can be anything from providing principals and other school leaders with the resources necessary to address the needs of their individual schools to you know infrastructure That's upgrades. Right. So uh, are right. you guys it's keeping like, check on, on what they're spending that money well, we on? Are. Yes. Yes, there's very strong monitoring going on. That's why we're looking at plans and auditing that will be done throughout the process. So our that is our responsibility at the Department of Education to oversee that. We've hired additional folks to be on uh, board watching that. And so, yes, there's ex um, very close monitoring of that funding. Gotcha. 
That's all the time we got, but thank you for joining us, State Superintendent of Education, okay. Molly Spearman. Thank you. Thank you. To discuss the latest on vaccination efforts, I'm joined by Dr. Rick Scott. He's Prisma Health's co-chair of the Health Vaccination Midlands Task Force. Dr. Scott, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Great to be here. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Scott, uh, tell us how things are going with Prisma Health and the system. You guys have been administering the most doses uh, of anyone in the state, as, of providers in the state. You're about 210,000 doses in at this point. Tell us how that's going and, and what it's looking like right now on the ground. So I think we took off like a greyhound, and uh, like many of the health systems and others, uh, we're pleased to get uh, early allocations of the vaccine, uh, which allowed us to really come out of the gates at, at high speed. I think we, uh, at one point, were vaccinating close to 10,000 people a day. And then I think we got a little ahead of the supply chain, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, to be fair to everyone, nobody has a great uh, predictive ability around. Um, at, you know, to give you some context, I think three weeks ago we administered 38,000 doses. That means we need to have 38,000 doses this week so we can hit that uh, three-week window. And luckily, uh, the CDC has extended that window a little bit further because uh, right now this week we have somewhere between 12 and 16,000 doses in our possession uh, to meet that. So some of those folks will probably not be exactly on day 21 but well within the safe range. And as data keeps coming out, we're seeing that the vaccine is actually quite effective, even with a single dose. Mm -hmm. So we feel confident that the people have good protection, uh, but we're suffering through the supply chain vagaries, which include uh, two or, or three major named winter storms uh, that no one predicted, uh, along with uh, some variation in how it rolls out of uh, the manufacturing plant. We only have the Pfizer vaccine Mm -hmm. So it does limit us a little bit. Yeah, I think that's important <laughs> to reiterate what you're talking about there in terms of if you don't get that the second dose immediately when you're scheduled to get it, it's still effective and you can still uh, get it several weeks thereafter as well. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're saying now up to six weeks is uh, certainly within reason, though we like to get people as close to the 21 day mark as we possibly can. And then uh, people that uh, due to weather or other changes miss their appointment, uh, we tell them if you're uh, past day 25 and we gave you that first dose, then just come on back in and we'll take care of you uh, and honor your appointment. Mm -hmm. So we're about almost three months into this vaccination rollout. Uh, Prisma has ramped up several mass vaccination sites. Kind of tell us a little bit about the journey to get to this point, uh, maybe some of the challenges you all have faced and overcome and, and where you see going forward. Sure. Well, you know, we started out with our hospital sites and, uh, and focused really on the 1A group, as well as the members in our community, the first responders and others that fell into that category. Uh, we quickly ramped up into two larger mass vaccination centers, uh, one in a Kmart adjacent to Greenville Memorial Hospital and a second one down here in the Midlands, which is uh, at Gamecock Park, a tremendous partnership with USC uh, to allow us to use their space and facility. Uh, there are, of course, uh, some some uh, issues around an out, outdoor site in the winter time, uh, but our team is out there regardless of temperature and if it's safe, uh, they're even often there in the rain. Um, we've started to uh, focus our efforts uh, now down to six sites as we get a better capability in the larger ones, but we're continuing to explore other options and partners, including uh, the possibility of partnering with Walmart or others uh, going forward. So we're, we're hopeful to get an even bigger space because we know this is uh, not a sprint, it's really a long haul. Uh, that said, we are anxious to see others join the battle with us because uh, we can only do so much as a hospital and health system, um, but uh, we expect very shortly to see uh, some of these other vaccines roll out into some of the commercial spaces and right into doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. The uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, will be a game changer as well some expected changes around the storage of the Pfizer vaccine. And doctor, just kind of follow up on this, how, how many doses could y'all give if you had maybe as much vaccine coming in as possible? I mean, have you guys looked into how much, what your kind of capacity you could expend to? Yeah, we, uh, we looked at our own internal numbers and thought that we could probably get up to 10 to 15,000 uh, doses uh, literally uh, a day. Um, unfortunately, uh, we can't staff to that uh, if the supply isn't there either. Mm -hmm. And honestly, uh, we won't be the only ones in the battle going forward as it becomes more available. I would envision this becomes much more like the seasonal flu shot that you can get in your own physician's office as soon as we have a um, cold stable 
uh, vaccine that will will live uh, for weeks in a refrigerator just like the flu shot does. Mm -hmm. And tell me a little bit about Prisma's outreach into underserved and, and vulnerable communities, specifically rural areas. Uh, you know, we're talking about these mask vaccination sites in Greenville and, and here in uh, Richland County, but uh, what are you all doing to reach those underserved populations? Well, we have some in our more rural sites too, uh, both uh, upstate and uh, down here in Sumter uh, at our Toomey site. Um, we're about to expand there, uh, we hope, into the civic center in town uh, from the hospital location. That'll allow us to do probably upwards of 500 doses a day. We've also just started uh, last weekend a pilot with some mobile units that will allow us to get out into these underserved areas proactively. And we're relying on uh, the locals in that area to reach out to us through their uh, church, through their uh, you know local uh, uh, political leaders to let us know uh, that they're there and, and need help. We do think that the drive through at Gamecock Park has been a, a game changer for many because it allows people who can only literally get from door to car to be vaccinated, and uh, even at the mass sites, uh, there's often a good walk from the parking lot all the way in. So we're trying to cover it from multiple directions, including outreach with um, what will be, I believe, uh, by the middle of May, six mobile vans. We have two now, uh, one upstate and one in the Midlands, uh, that uh, deployed for the first time last weekend, and we're, we're working through the best way to use those. Gotcha. Yeah, that's an important uh, demographic to reach out to there when we're talking about rural and underserved areas. I want to talk to you about uh, some of the key indicators we're seeing in the state declining. Some good news. Our cases per 100,000, our positivity rates, hospitalizations, that's ICU and ventilator use, and our deaths are also going down. Um, what's it been like at Prisma facilities? What are you all seeing? I'm guessing this is also being reflected in your admissions, in your current population, and what you're seeing and maybe what you can, uh, you know, correlate this to. Is this because of the vaccine being rolled out and being implemented at this point? Well, I wish to. I wish that I could take credit for that with the vaccine as a uh, as a uh, medical person, but I think um, some of that is true, and some of it may be just serendipity having to do with changes in the weather and the fact that there are probably many more people that have had a subacute case of COVID than we really uh, uh, are aware of, and so the vaccine combined with um, many thousands more having already had the disease is probably helping limit some of those super spreader events. We saw our numbers go through the roof this uh, this winter, uh, first with Thanksgiving, then Christmas, then New Year's right after. And boy, that uh, first few weeks of January uh, strained every health system to its absolute limit. Uh, that said, we have started to see the numbers come down. Uh, the numbers that we have on ventilators are now the lowest they've been uh, since Thanksgiving. Um, that said, the numbers seem pretty scary on the way up that now coming down have become almost the new normal. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want anybody in South Carolina to drop their guard, though, because when I look at the national numbers, I can still only find Iowa in a worse uh, place than we are. Uh, and we're um, very close behind New York and New Jersey and some other states that are uh, still challenged. So yeah. I think we're going in the right direction, but it's not time to, uh, uh, to put out the mission accomplished banner yet. Uh, and we are hopeful, though, that the numbers will continue to trend down. Yeah, and unfortunately, like we're talking about some negative indicators, unfortunately, our test, our number of tests have also been going down, too. So people will need to still continue being tested if they're out and about a good bit. I want to ask you about the Johnson Johnson vaccine, which we expect to come online if approved later, uh, I guess, in March. So uh, how do you see that maybe fitting into uh, the vaccine rollout? Is that going to be more like the Moderna vaccine where it probably goes to uh, you know, the pharmacies and the, the small yeah, clinics? Yeah, I, I would expect that because the storage requirements around that vaccine are significantly uh, more liberal, um, that that will be a vaccine more widely available in commercial space and in physicians' offices, ideally. Um, when I read the data that's being uh, presented to the FDA, it's actually very encouraging. Um, people focused on a 66 or 70% uh, uh, rate of protection uh, but you read a little bit further into the data and find that nobody required an intensive care unit and there were no fatalities, literally, in giving out uh, 40,000 plus doses, including some of the testing done in South Africa. So uh, very promising uh, that it's going to be a, a, a vaccine of wide utility. And if you think about it, uh, only having to give one dose would have meant uh, that we had many more people uh, actually protected uh, than uh, we can with Pfizer and Moderna. 
Yeah, a lot of encouraging news there. And Dr. Scott, one quick final question. Uh, we did surpass a very grim milestone as a country this week with 500,000 Americans dead, uh, more than 7,400 of those were South Carolinians. Uh, really quick, just tell me, did you ever think that we would reach this point in this pandemic and what keeps you optimistic? Well, I tell you, I, I did not. And uh, I feel like I've lived this twice. Uh, it, this time last spring, I was headed back to New Jersey to help them open their COVID relief hospital in Atlantic City as the chief medical officer. And at that time, we were looking at dire predictions of up to 120,000 uh, fatalities. Uh, the fact is, um, we all knew there was going to be a, a second spike. Uh, we didn't know that it would be twice the size of the first one. Uh, and so uh, what really uh, does give me optimism, though, is uh, we will have uh, three great tools uh, at our disposal. And we've also got the monoclonal antibody and antibody uh, 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 cocktails available to us now. Mm -hmm. um, we opened a clinic here at Prisma for that in the Midlands and have uh, given uh, upwards of 1,500 doses so far across uh, the entire state. And uh, if we can continue to identify at-risk, vulnerable people in the correct age group, and get that to them, we may be able to uh, keep them from ever ending up uh, in an ICU. Gotcha, yeah, let's try and keep that uh, encouraging news on our minds going forward. Dr. Rick Scott is the co-chair of the Prisma Health Vaccination Midlands Task Force. Sir, thank you very much for joining us and for your work. Thank you so much for having me, I appreciate it. I look forward to summer. To stay up to date with the latest news throughout the week, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast that I host on Tuesdays and Saturdays. You can find it on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org or wherever you find podcasts. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.